Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host Tenley Thompson and we've got some great videos from the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem to show you this week. The way this is going to work is I'm going to show you the latest and greatest in wildlife sightings and other awesome natural things that the wildlife guides and biologists here at Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures have seen throughout Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Then you're going to have a chance to win our trivia question of the week for a gift card to our Eco Tour store. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got any questions for a wildlife biologist, naturalist, uh, anything about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem or anything else, do go ahead and ask me those questions in the comment section. And I love questions from all ages, from zero to a hundred. So keep that in mind as we get through the broadcast and as questions come up. All right, our big story of the week again is everybody's favorite, Grizzly Bear 399. So I thought I'd let Sarah with some footage put in from Kelsey, who also gave us our footage from our welcome video this week, tell you a little bit about what she's been up to this week. Let's check in. Hello, this is Sarah with Eco Tour Adventures, and we had quite a morning coming up in the Grand Teton Park. I heard on the radio a transmission from our guy Kirk, who had spotted Grizzly Bear 399 and her four cubs just up the road. So several of us guides, Kelsey and both Sarah, Sarah E and Sarah W and Mike were all able to come up, thanks to Kirk, and view Grizzly 90, 399 and her cubs. The last time I saw her was in mid-September and especially in July, but in August and early September too, she was looking uh, a little bit skinny, which is to be expected for a senior mom with four cubs. But over the last month, she's put on quite a bit of weight from the service berries she was feeding on at the end of August and September, as well as some elk that she apparently found uh, out in the woods. We've been talking this fall a lot about hyperphagia and the need of bears to consume as many as 20,000 calories each meal. As you see these cubs bouncing around, digging up roots as their mom is teaching them to do, they just look like little round butter balls right now. And if you were to take a peek inside that furry coat, the color of the fat inside these little bear cubs is a little different than the color of the fat in us humans, at least in most of us adult humans. But newborns, both newborn animals and humans, have brown fat, and bears typically put on brown fat as they're going into hibernation. Brown fat costs more calories per pound to build but a bear is able to metabolize it while they're hibernating and the urea they produce, the waste product, rather than being uh, released from the bear as urine, can be converted directly into muscle fiber. So as a bear hibernates, it's able to maintain its muscle mass. Compare that to a human, if we were on five months of bed rest, it would possibly take us over a year to re regain our athletic abilities that we lost after five months of bed rest. But a bear has to be ready to go straight from the den's door when she's coming out of hibernation. So even though it costs more calories per pound to build, uh, bears focus on building up that brown fat as they're preparing in hibernation. These cubs are a very good example of bears that have successfully put on brown fat. Bears also have a lot of other interesting adaptations to becoming obese and then skinny and then obese and then skinny every year. They don't get gallstones, which tends to happen in humans when we lose weight rapidly or yo-yo diet. Bears have an acid that can dissolve any gallstones that form. They also don't suffer the other consequences of obesity that humans tend to suffer, such as heart disease, high cholesterol, and diabetes. So even though in us humans, putting on too much fat every year is not such a good thing with bears, it's part of their normal. And it's very encouraging to see 399 and her cubs round and chubby this time of year. This is Sarah Ernst with Ecotour Adventures. All right, always great to check in with 399 and those quadruplets. They've been putting on quite a show throughout the week and really attracting quite a lot of attention on the roadside. So a big reminder to everybody, if you're traveling to Grand Teton and Yellowstone, you want to take the 100 yard pledge. And we in the Travel and Tourism Bureau want to encourage everybody to keep their distance at least 100 yards from any grizzly bear in Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Park.
So next, let's check in with our annual nine day fall photography workshop because they always end up getting the coolest sightings of wildlife. And certainly we'll get more from them as they decompress, they just finished up, uh, but they wanted to give us a little sneak preview and a little sneak peek at some of the great things they saw while they were out and about over these last nine days. Josh Metten, our local in-house photographer and professional photographer, Nate Luby, had a really amazing nine-day annual photo fall photography workshop this year. And we wanted to share with you some of the highlights from that great trip and some of the awesome wildlife that they saw while they were out there, including this amazing giant bull moose, this cow and her two calves in Grand Teton National Park. The group was lucky to get a couple days of viewing of this particular rut breeding pair and this bull moose was incredibly cooperative with his posing and so that was a big highlight as was of course grizzly bear 399 and her quadruplets and then something i don't get to see very often pretty rare they got a whole half day with this great gray owl just getting an opportunity to photograph and observe and really be with this animal which is something you don't always get the opportunity to do on these four hour or eight hour trips they can stay with these animals for a long time and really get some of their great behaviors including this bee Beaver family, family, which they got some awesome views of family behavior, dam building, social interactions, and of course that lovely awesome aspen reflections on the uh, water with these guys and the beautiful light as well. Just made for a really, really fun evening with this beaver family. So a lot of the clients said this was a real highlight for them, uh, believe it or not. Even though they got lots of opportunities for large animals, they really enjoyed seeing this beaver family hard at work. When they got up into Yellowstone National Park, they got quite a few opportunities to really see bison in their natural habitat and photograph family groups like this bull, cow, and calf. And then they got a particularly extraordinary opportunity one morning when this bull bison decided to walk through this hot spring area and that reflection of the blue and the golden color of fall really personifies what the fall workshop is all about. Of course, rut groups and breeding groups can happen anywhere, including just outside Yellowstone at this track where these pronghorn antelope were having their breeding group. They also got an opportunity to see some wildlife that are more unusual in Grand Teton National Park in the summer. We see bighorn sheep in the wintertime, but to really see them in the summer is something you'd have to visit Yellowstone on a multi-day trip, really get into the northern aspects of the park to have an opportunity with. So that was definitely a real highlight, these rams right by that rustling water, and and then they got another opportunity at a rare bird as well, which is this trumpeter swan duo, um, which is always, of course, a photography favorite. So a big thanks to Josh Metten and Nate Luby for giving us a check-in from their fall photography workshop. I hope you enjoyed some of the highlights. So a fun fall workshop that's always such an amazing trip, maybe one of the penultimate trips we offer during the year. I'd say that one and our eight day wolves in winter expedition are kind of these just unbelievable experiences. You make so many friends along the way. We do have next year's workshop already open and it does fill quickly. So if that's something you think you'd love to do, definitely check it out on our website. Maddie can give you more information about that, I'm sure. Although Maddie, I'm not sure we have it like up. It's the dates are available on the website, but I don't know if we have all the information available. So Maddie will find what he can for us. In the meantime, I thought, you know what? Seth is always such a favorite here at Wildlife Wednesday. He always makes some pretty funny videos about wildlife. I thought I'd give him something that um, maybe would be slightly drier material for another guy that he'd find pretty humorous and make fun for everybody, which of course is our aspen trees. Our famous quaking aspens are changing color this fall. Let's check in with him. Your challenge, should you choose to accept it, is how many puns he makes in this one video. Let's check it out. Hi everyone, Seth Latka here with Jackson Holt Eco Tours, and I'm just tuning in to teach you guys some more about another uh, Greater Yellow e Yellowstone Ecosystem local, the aspen trees. So it's been snowing overnight. Um, it's gonna snow a little bit more tonight, and slowly these leaves are gonna continue to fall. And so before all of them leaf us, um, I wanted to teach you a little bit more about the aspens. So what a lot of people don't know is that when you see a large group of the aspen trees, 10, 20, even 50 of them next to each other, odds are it's really just one or two trees. 
The reason being is they have what's called a rhizomic root system. Now what that means is yes, they do spread via seed, but also once a mother tree is established, roots will grow out radially from that tree and then um, it'll clone itself and genetically identical trees, or you can think of them as branches, sprout from that root system. This makes them um, one of the largest land living organisms in the world. The largest one is in Utah, it's called Pando, and it's about 100 acres, and they date the root system to be a couple thousand years old. Um, so pretty interesting stuff with that. Also, if you go up to one of these trees, let's find a good one here, maybe this big one, and give them a good rub. I know it's a little weird, just stick with me here. This white powder comes off. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but I just rubbed it on my face because it's a natural, it's a natural sunscreen that the tree is producing to protect itself in these high alpine environments where they're bombarded by UV rays. If they didn't produce that natural sunscreen, their bark would dry out, the trees would crack, and they would ultimately die. Now another interesting thing about these trees is sometimes you'll see moose chewing on the bark. Um, Native Americans noticed this and they kind of comprehended what was happening and copied it. What the moose are doing um, when they're experiencing birthing pains or hunger pains, they'll actually chew on the bark on the Cambrian layer right below the bark surface. Um, and there's actually a constituent of aspirin, the medicine, in aspen trees. So it's a mild painkiller that the moose will chew on. Um, Native Americans make it into a tea for medicine as well. Um, one other interesting thing about these aspen trees is once all their leaves fall, they don't actually stop growing. During the winter, their bark takes the job of the leaves. So their bark is actually photosynthetic. I don't know if you've ever seen a green tint to the bark, but that's chlorophyll that the bark is producing from the sun's energy. So they don't stop growing over the winter, they keep growing. And because of that, they have a head start on all the other deciduous trees, trees with leaves. And come springtime, they actually flower and drop their seeds and flowers before the leaves grow back because they have all this energy already built up. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, I'm glad I could teach you guys a little bit more about what's happening here uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Hope you guys enjoy and I hope to see you out here soon. So always fun to catch in with Seth. If you've never been on an all day trip up into Yellowstone or the like with Seth, it's a lot of fun. He's such a funny guy and he knows so much about the natural world. So always a favorite. By the way, we take requests here at Wildlife Wednesday. So if there's a specific guide or specific species you'd like to hear about, do let us know. I know we had some more requests for owls and river otters last week. As you can tell, we got some great footage of owls. So we've got a forthcoming video on that. We've also probably got some great river otter video coming up either this week or next week. It's all about when uh, I can put all that together. I think we've got maybe 12 minutes on river otters and uh, hopefully we'll have it for you next week. In the meantime, uh, guys, it's just so great to see everybody tuning in every week. A lot of old friends here on Wildlife Wednesday. I feel like we need to like have like a reunion or a get together at some point. Although in the COVID era, I'm not sure how to do that. Maybe on Zoom or something and I get to see you all in person. It's like having our little Wildlife Wednesday family. So a big hello to everybody who said hi to me and hi to us and hi to Maddie. We're so glad to see you back this week. I thought it'd be fun to go back to Wildlife Wednesday favorite Laura and have her talk a little bit about black bears. We've had so much black bear activity as we do with the annual ritual of fall. Lots of guides reporting in some great stuff. So this is footage from Seth, Taylor, Sarah, Jason, Kelsey, and Laura, all about some of the great black bear activity we've had recently. Hi everybody, this is Laura. I've been having some great luck this week finding black bears in the southern area of Grand Teton National Park where they're still feasting on berries. They've especially been enjoying the, the hawthorn berries, which are a dark blue or purple colored fruit. Also choke cherries, which is the tree that you see right behind me. <laughs> and some surface berries as well. The scientific name or Linnaean name for black bears is Ursus americanus. Ursus is a Latin word, which means bear, 
and these bears are widely distributed throughout North America, so hence the name Ursus americanus. It's nice to be able to view bears, but we want to maintain a good safe distance away from them. 100 yards is the standard minimum distance to view a bear in Grand Teton National Park. So we've been using our great Maven optics, our binoculars and spotting scopes to see bears from a safe distance for us and for the bears as well. But I wanna to get to know the black bear a little bit better from afar. Now, let me give you some good information about black bears. You know, first of all, they're omnivores. They eat a wide variety of fruits, such as berries, other plants like roots and pine nuts, seeds, sometimes meat like carrion from dead animals, or smammals, which is our abbreviation for small mammals, but I just think it's funny. <laughs> And also sometimes bird eggs. They love a good omelet and even small birds too. <laughs> so a good variety of different things. I think that's what helped the black bear survive through the last major transition coming out of that last major ice age event about 15,000 years ago. Other bears did exist here in North America at that time. For example, the, the short faced bear and the, the, <laughs> the spectacled bear, I can never say that correctly, <laughs> spectacled bear, which survived in Florida at that time. And the short-faced bear and spectacled bear um, primarily uh, sourced their food from meat, whereas the more adaptable black bear or Ursus americanus was um, more varied. His diet consisted of, of a lot of different things, including many plants. So he made it through that last major ice age, age event, whereas the other types of bears did not here in North America. That's one thing that makes them so special and still so widespread across North America. Um, did you know that black bears used to be larger than they are today? Um, there's a, a fossil skeleton of a black bear found in Pennsylvania from about 4 million years ago that was about the same size as our, our grizzlies or brown bears would be today. This thing likely weighed in around 1,200 pounds. So it was quite a bit larger than most adult black bears these days who would weigh in for a male somewhere between uh, 150 to 600 pounds and for a female between 90 to 350 pounds. So they're still pretty big in some cases, you know, they're much, much bigger than us. <laughs> I don't think I could take one down with my bare hands, but <laughs> imagine a black bear being, you know, maybe twice as big. Bears usually start their hibernation in early winter around here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. That usually means in November or December, although I've heard of bears staying out a little bit later into January. And they'll usually stay in hibernation for several months, uh, emerging back out into the world right around March or April. But if a food source becomes available during that time, or if conditions improve and there's a carcass nearby or something like that, bears can come out of their dens. So even on my wintertime tours in the snow, I, I still do carry my bear spray for defense. <laughs> now, during hibernation, a bear w won't go to the bathroom. He also won't eat a thing. He lowers his heart rate and his respiratory rate and also drops his body temperature by an average of about 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a relatively small amount. Uh, other mammals who hibernate, um, they, they may drop their body temperature all the way down to freezing. So 32 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or in some cases, even lower. 
Yeah. During that hibernation time, a female bear might give birth to baby cubs. For black bears, usually that means one to three cubs, but sometimes even more than that, I've heard of four, five, or six cubs in rare circumstances. Uh, a bear's gonna den, usually in a cave, a burrow, a brush pile, or sometimes even up in trees. I always think of Winnie the Pooh in his hollowed out tree, but that also could mean tree cavities, which could be well off the ground. You know, bears know the forest kind of like the inside of their, their home. I know every nook and cranny of my house. So a bear would know every li little nook of his forest, including tree cavities up say 60 or 70 feet from the ground level. And he might just crawl inside that, that little hole and spend his winter denning in that spot. And I always like to imagine if I was a little baby cub and I just was born, say in the den in February, my first ex excursion out into the wor world might be to scale or climb down that tree. Luckily for bear cubs, they're well adapted for climbing. They have short hooked claws, kind of like kittens or cats. <laughs> they can easily make their way down out of a tree if that's their their first time doing it. <laughs> that said, just the other day I was um, I was in Grand Teton National Park in the southern end and there was a black bear high up in an aspen tree using it as a, a perch to feast on nearby hawthorn berries and this little black bear made a mistake <laughs> He accidentally ah, let go and plummeted ah, about 25 feet down into the forest. And then there was a bunch of bustling that happened down in the forest and he vanished. <laughs> um, my guess is he was embarrassed after that fall. But uh, thank you for your curiosity about black bears. To me, they're, they're one of the most charismatic megafauna here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Of course, to keep black bears and grizzly bears safe in our communities, we want to make sure to store our trash and our human foods appropriately so that bears cannot get into them. Uh, that means having trash safe containers for bears. Um, also, if we're out backpacking in the forest, we just want to make sure to store food in a place where a bear cannot access it. And even things like bird feeders and other household items need to be, you know, well off the ground in a safe place where a bear cannot get into it. Because the slogan is, a fed bear is a dead bear. All right, well, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of our show. Cheers, guys. All right, thanks very much to Laura for that great view of black bears throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It's just a really good time of year here in fall to see bears. Spring is also a fantastic time as these bears are in hyperphagia stuffing their faces. They're so obsessed with food. They're not as concerned about people. So if you are out and about in the Tetons, keep your eyes open for black bears. They can definitely be on roadsides and so we don't want to see them hit by cars either. Uh, but it's been really, really a particularly good fall this year. It's been really fun, guys. As that video was going on, I was seeing all these great comments comments coming in for our question and answer session. I'm so excited to get those to you in just a couple minutes here. We'll answer some of them. Some really good questions this week, guys. I'm pretty psyched about that. I do want to remind everybody, if you're thinking about coming out to the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and you're thinking about coming on a trip, we are offering 10% off a trip if you mention our Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup when you book our programs. Maddie can go ahead and give us a link to the winter offerings that we have. I will tell you, if you plan on being out here in the holidays, we are filling up fast. So I would definitely get your bookings done early, not only for us, but for any other activities you might be planning to enjoy. We we also, of course, do a lot of cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the winter, which is one of my favorite things to do with guests. So something to keep in mind, 10% off if you want to be involved with that. And don't forget, if you're enjoying these broadcasts, to like and share our videos. That helps spread our reach, helps make these videos possible.
possible and worth continuing to do. So we certainly don't want to sit here and advertise at you. That's not the point of what we're here to do. But we do want to make sure that you guys are spreading the love if you're enjoying this and you know somebody who might enjoy it as well. Or maybe somebody in your family or um, one of your children or grandchildren might have a question for a wildlife biologist and I am here to answer them every week. So, all right, enough on that. Let's check in on pronghorn antelope with Mike. The main reason I wanted to talk about pronghorn this week is they're going to be leaving us soon. They're all, they're not all going to die or anything, but they are migrating more than a hundred miles to the south to their annual winter grounds. Basically with the next snowstorm, That'll be their cue to get out of town. Some years they've already left the valley, other years they may stay and linger for a little while, but I did want to get some last views of pronghorn before they depart and some great interpretation of this amazing species from Mike. So let's check it out. I wanted to share some great footage with you this week about pronghorn antelope. And pronghorn antelope are the fastest land mammal in all of North America capable of reaching speeds 60, 65 miles an hour. And they're also the fastest long distance runner, capable of doing 35 miles an hour for 15 miles, no stops, no breaks, no problem. And to be able to pull off these amazing feats, they have oversized lungs, oversized hearts, tiny little hooves built for speed that have pads in them. And their leg bones are not much bigger than the diameter of my finger. So just absolutely incredibly fast and very rare to be both the fastest sprinter and also the fastest marathon runner. So probably make Elon Musk very jealous to find this out. And the pronghorn antelope is not really even native to North America. It's instead native to Africa and Eurasia. The pronghorn antelope is the only living member of Antilocopridae. Its closest living relative is actually the giraffe. And the pronghorn antelope is one of my favorite critters because they're always visible. Their competitive advantage is out in the open flats where they can supposedly see a predator up to four miles away. So easily eight times the vision that you or I have. And they have eyes on the side of their head so they can actually see over 300 degrees. Some people have said maybe 320, 340 degrees. And while the pronghorn antelope can jump, say 20 feet in a single bound, I have never seen one jump over a fence. Instead, they get down on their bellies and drag themselves underneath the fence. Nobody really knows why. I speculate maybe because their eyes are so far on the sides of their head, they can't triangulate distance as well as you or I could. Or maybe those tiny little leg bones don't allow them to gain the height they would need coming down on the other. Not sure what was going on there guys we maybe had a little bit of a technical difficulty with the pronghorn video there my apologies but hopefully you guys got a pretty good view of that amazing species and you were able to enjoy that so that was pretty fun big thanks thanks to mike for a great look at such an awesome animal um we also had great contributions on that one from taylor tyler and laura lots of t's on that one tenley taylor tyler we have a lot of t's on our staff so, all right guys, it's time for my second favorite part of the broadcast, which is our trivia question of the week. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you last week's trivia question, which everybody said was too easy. Um, and <laughs> go ahead and comment if you want in the comment section uh, what the answer is. But we've already chosen last week's winner and let them know. Uh, so <laughs> if you haven't heard from us, you're probably not last week's winner. Um, but go ahead and comment if you think you know the answer. And that is, of course, what is the um, number of this bear? Huh, very strange here, guys. My videos aren't showing. I guess it's not the end of the world because after all, that was the last major video that we had. Um, but the question last week, of course, was what was the collar number, uh, the research number of that bear? Um, 
And the answer was Grizzly Bear 399. So if you got that right last week, um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was a little bit easier. My favorite part was then later on in the question and answer when folks were asking me um, how 399 was doing. And I was like, oh, go back a little bit and you can see a great video of her. So big thanks to our naturalist, Jason, for that footage. Okay, now comes this week's trivia question of the week. Okay, guys, you've been telling me they've been too easy for weeks. So I had a plan. What I did is I teamed up with our biologist, Sarah Ernst who is like the one who, when you're watching these shows, is encyclopedic with her knowledge. And I said, Sarah, I need your help. My questions are too easy. And she's come up with a whole stack of really tricky ones. So Dawn and Susan and everybody who was giving me grief last week, I have a game plan. The way this is gonna work is I'm gonna ask you a question and to win, all you have to do is comment in the comment section but I'm also going to do an extra credit hard version of the question. So for those of you guys who are new to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem or our wildlife, it might be a little bit easier. And then there's going to be the bonus part that you're welcome to answer in the comment section as well. So let's see how you do, particularly you, Don and Susan, um, and see if we can't get you guys a little bit more stumped because I'm telling you what, Sarah is a much better quiz master than I am. Now, the winner of this, if you post your comments, will give you a $10 gift card to our Eco Tour Adventure store, which Maddie hopefully will be good enough to put up for us. That awesome store was created uh, for um, employee health insurance to go ahead and uh, help support us during the COVID closure so we could keep our insurance. So go ahead and check it out. There's some pretty awesome stuff. $10 is probably enough for one of our face masks or some of our the owl stickers that are on there, but also lots of other great stuff um, if you wanna support us and somebody's gonna win some money to that store. Okay, so the question is, um, the suspense is killing us. Yes, Maddie, the suspense is killing all of us. The question is, I want you to name me an animal that lives between Grand Teton and Yellowstone that turns white in the winter, that has a different color in the winter than it does in the summer. And I couldn't really put an image up for this or it would give it away. If you want your bonus, and Susan and Don, I'm looking at you, there are four animals that change color they're one color in the summer and they're one color in the winter. Can you name all four animals? If you can, what I'm gonna do is the number of animals you name are the entries you get into our drawing for that gift card. So if you just know one, that's enough to enter the drawing. If you know four, you should probably come work for us because uh, you really know your wildlife. And let's see how everybody does. Um, and see how many correct answers we get this week. And uh, hopefully I've got some of you stumped. Let me know what you think of Sarah and I's new quiz plan of the easier question with the bonus, more difficult part. And let me know, was this hard? Was this easy? I thought it was pretty hard to name all four. I had to think about it for a minute. Maddie, let us know, do you know all four? Don't tell us what they are, don't give it away. But Maddie, who's running our comment section, who's also one of our naturalists, we'll see how he does at this as well. Um, but yeah, I'll give you guys a hint. It's not a moose. Everybody always says my hints give it away. It's not a moose. It's not a bison. Gotta think a little bit more differently than that. All right, very fun. Uh, that's what we've got for our trivia. Now, of course, is my favorite part of the whole broadcast. I'm here to answer your questions live. So if you've got a question for me, go ahead and ask in the comment section uh, and I will see if I can't get you an answer. Let me sort of take a quick look. I've got my iPad here. Um, so when you see me looking down, that's what's going on. I'm looking and seeing if I know the answers to your questions. Hang on, let's see here. I'm gonna go all the way to the top. We'll get to the first questions first. Um, the first one comes from Krista. She says, are four cubs rare? I am guessing. Krista, four cubs are very rare. Um, you're talking, of course, about grizzly bear 399 and her quadruplets. Four cubs in grizzly bears is incredibly rare. Um, and it's so rare, we don't actually have a number for how rare it is. It's slightly more common in black bears than it is in grizzly bears. Um, triplets in grizzly bears are about one in 500 grizzly bear births. 
Um, and of course, nobody's exactly sure how many grizzly bears we have in the continental United States, uh, but somewhere sub 2000. So you can see how unusual that would be. Quadruplets, so unusual, we um, don't necessarily actually have a rate of knowing how much it is. However, weirdly enough, grizzly bears practice what's called delayed implantation, which is to say they breed in the spring but they actually wait to implant those fertilized eggs into their uterus until usually about December. And then typically the health and the condition of the bear dictates how many eggs are implanted. So if the bear is in really good condition, it may, for instance, implant two eggs. Historically, that's how we understood grizzly bears. However, 399 keeps having triplets and now has had quadruplets, which is strongly indicative single-handedly that there has to be a genetic component to this as well. There's no way she'd be having as many multiples, particularly considering last fall she was in pretty rough condition, certainly in no condition to be having quadruplets. So it may be that our traditional understanding that the health of the mother determines how many eggs are implanted. Um, she may single-handedly prove us wrong on that. So great question. Thank you very much for that. Rosalie asks, are wolves monogamous or do they mate freely? Rosalie, great question. And we just had a new research paper on this. So pretty fun. Just came out the latest study on this subject. And it found that 80% of wolves are monogamous, which is to say they choose a mate and mate for life. If that mate, of course, passes away, they may get another mate. But the alpha male and the alpha female tend to be monogamous. Um, that divorce rate, so to speak, of 20%, far, far lower than in people, generally speaking, quite monogamous. And also about the same rate that you'd see in other animals we traditionally think of as monogamous, like, say, birds. So, yes, wolves are monogamous. Great question. Lessa says, okay, Tenley, 399 looks better. Doesn't she? Guys, she looks so much better. I mean, her cubs look like little butterball turkeys. But she looks so much better. So I'm really excited about that. I guess that's not a question, it's a comment, but so it goes. Let's see what else we have here. Susan says, we should definitely do a meetup for Wildlife Wednesday groupies, maybe in the dead of winter. Maybe we should do a Zoom or something. Let me know in the comment section what you think. I think that'd be really fun. We'll just have like a little cocktail hour or something. That would be a blast. Let's see here. Do black bears kill elk or just grizzlies, ask Susan. Susan, that's a really good question. Black bears absolutely can kill grizzlies. It's, uh, well, black bears absolutely can kill elk. I'm not familiar with black bears killing grizzlies. It must be possible, but I, I, I don't know of any cases. Um, black bears can kill almost anything, including other black bears. Um, but they are not cannibals. They wouldn't eat those black bears, but they might, for instance, if they feel... Um, attacked or if they feel threatened, they can certainly fight each other. Uh, black bears actually can kill elk, particularly elk calves. They're not as successful at it as grizzlies who are more built for it. Black bears are usually built for smaller game, but they absolutely are capable of killing and consuming elk. Um, in fact, what you just asked me is gonna come up again in somebody else's question, so stay tuned. There's a question. Linda asks, have any of the guides had a too close for comfort encounter with bears? Linda, unfortunately, I think every guide on staff has probably had a too close for comfort encounter with bears. When I tell everybody it's incredibly important to keep your distance and give bears at least 100 yards, it's not because it's Yellowstone and Grand Teton's rules or uh, that you can get a ticket in the parks if you don't follow those rules. It's because it's common sense. Um, I've spent my entire life trying to educate people about bears and educate how amazing they are and to try to help people understand that a lot of what we think about bears in this country is either greatly over exaggerated or just downright silly. People come out here terrified. They don't want to go hiking. They say, well, I'd love to go for a hike, but a grizzly bear is going to get me. And I, I don't laugh at them, but I want to laugh at them. Um, you know what? Grizzly bears are perfectly capable of attacking people. But your odds are so rare, it's a little bit difficult to calculate. Um, anybody have any guesses on how many people are killed by sharks every year in the United States? About two. Any guesses on how many people are killed by grizzlies every year in the United States? It's about an average of two. Now that means, guys, some years it's, it's zero and some years it's four, right? It's an average of two. Um, 
Black bears kill somebody in this country on average once every 10 years, to give you an idea of the difference between the two. But we have over 2 million visitors to Yellowstone National Park annually. So your odds are like one in 2 million. So you're far more likely to get yourself in trouble in the natural world doing all sorts of things. The odds of you falling on a steep slope in the snow in Grand Teton National Park and injuring yourself are way higher. The odds of you um, getting into an aggressive encounter with a moose or a bison are way, way, way higher. The odds of you getting burned by a hot spring in Yellowstone um, are way, way higher. We have um, between five to 10 of each of those uh, every year in the park. And so I think a lot of people, I guess the best way to put it is this way. If a bison attacks somebody that usually doesn't make it in the paper, people don't talk about that. But if a grizzly bear does, it's a great way to sell newspapers, right? If a shark does, it's a great way to sell, sell newspapers. But if a leopard seal attacks somebody, nobody really cares about that. So I think it's a lot of sensationalism. I certainly had some encounters I wasn't super thrilled about. Um, probably the one that concerned me the most was a black bear, not a grizzly. Um, there was an elk who'd been struck by a car and it was on the side of the road uh, in Grand Teton National Park. And I was out very early in the morning on my way to go look for some wolves. And uh, the car in front of me had stopped. I came around a corner. There was a stopped car. All four doors of this rental car were open. And everybody was crowded over onto one side of the road. What had happened is a large, large black bear, biggest black bear I've ever seen, uh, probably a 400-pound black bear, had found this elk that had been struck by a car in the night and was feeding on it right on the side of the road. And these folks were maybe five to eight feet away. Uh, from the black bear and they were pointing their iPads at it trying to get some pictures and um, the movies tell you that when a bear is upset they stand on their hind legs and go Roar! no they don't actually they get really low and they hiss and it's pretty scary stuff and this black bear was down on all fours with his teeth bared and he was at them trying to get them to get away from him and his prize and these folks, uh, I'm not familiar with the language they spoke, but they certainly were not English speakers. They were sort of chattering at each other very excitedly. They clearly didn't understand that there was a risk to them. And at that point, I had a really hard choice to make, which is to say, I, I didn't want to get hurt. Um, but I didn't want to see them get hurt. And I kind of sat there and was frozen in indecision, I'm embarrassed to say, for a minute, trying to decide how far I wanted to get involved until they took their young child and kind of pushed them in front of them to get a better look. And that scared me. I really didn't want to see somebody get hurt. So I grabbed my bear spray, hopped out of my car and kind of yelled at them to back up. But they weren't good English speakers or didn't understand a lot of English and didn't understand what I was doing or really frustrated at me for making all that noise and kind of waved me off and told me to mind my own business, which I was really, really concerned. So I ended up going up there, grabbing them and telling them they had to come back. Everybody was able to back up. Um, that black bear continued to creep towards us. I was definitely very concerned. But everybody got in their vehicles, including me. Um, and at that point, they drove off and I made the decision to leave the scene as well. Um, so yeah, not even a grizzly bear, right? Um, I live in grizzly country. Certainly those encounters are things that I've come closer than I would have liked to have a grizzly bear. That black bear, you notice, never actually acted on it. He was being defensive. He wanted to keep his food. Black bears don't want to go after people. They see us as superior predators like a grizzly bear, a predator bigger and better than they are. They certainly don't want to threaten us, but he didn't want to lose his kill either. I think to this day, those folks probably tell stories about me from whatever country they were from about this mean, annoying American woman who made them, uh, disrupted their amazing experience with nature to go drive off into um and drive away and they're probably still mad at me not having any idea how close to disaster they probably came so yes that's my too close to a bear encounter story um i'm not real happy in retrospect with exactly all the decisions i made i think if i was going to do it again this is many years later i probably would have acted differently i could have stayed in my car and you know yelled instructions and not put myself in a dangerous situation but uh, yeah, real close to deploying that bear spray that day. So, okay, there's my random bear question. Let's see here. What else we got? Hang on.
Jose asks, are black bears cohabitating with grizzly bears? Do they live in the same habitat is what I assume you mean, Jose. Yes, they do. Uh, we do see them in the same areas all the time. Oftentimes they're foraging for different food resources. So um, at a time of year when uh, grizzly bears might be going for elk calves, black bears might be going for glacier lilies or Indian potato plants. So it's not always in the same area, but they absolutely do cohabitate. So great question. Oops, there we go. Do any birds besides some owls winter in the area? Yes, yeah, Sadie, that's a great question. So we have about 300 to four, 350 to 300, 378, I think was the last number of birds who overwinter in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, but in the winter, we have 150 species of birds. So they don't certainly all, sorry, okay. <laughs> Slightly less than 400, 400 birds in the summertime uh, that are here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. More than 150 species of birds stay and do not migrate, migrate away for the winter time. Um, so great question. We certainly have um, lots of owls that winter in the area, um, but we have lots of songbirds, um, insectivorous birds, really, really fun, beautiful color birds. Um, cedar waxwings are one of my favorite winter birds. And uh, there's another question about birds that's coming up in the winter, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's see here. Does the waterfall in the Grand Canyon area freeze over the lower falls of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone? That's a great question, Don. It, it doesn't freeze over entirely, but it's not uncommon to see it in very cold winters to um, freeze sort of a shell over the top. So you can still sort of see water seething out, but there's kind of this exterior casing that can kind of go around it. Some winters it's only about halfway up the falls as it kind of builds its way up with ice. And some winters it's um, practically covering over the entire waterfall, which is really kind of a neat thing to see. It gets so cold up there in the canyon. So great question. Maddie says, I had a very close encounter while looking through my optics for $3.99. I believe it's because $3.99 made the encounter a very calm, peaceful one. So there you go. There's Maddie's too close for comfort bear experience. Thanks, Maddie. Let's see here. Sadie says, Laura's happiness is contagious. It is, isn't it? Her happiness is contagious. She's that fun in person. Uh, so once again, like I was saying, if you've got favorite guides, man, Laura's just fun. She just makes the, makes the world happy. So that's great. I agree with you, Sadie. Let's see here. What do beavers and otters do in the winter months, says Kim. So Kim, uh, river otters behave in the winter much as they do in the summer. They do den in riverbanks. Oftentimes they'll use abandoned muskrat or beaver dens as their own. Um, but they continue to feed on fish um, and other aquatic animals all winter long. In fact, river otters will occasionally go and look for a baby beaver uh, during the winter time. Beavers, of course, build these lodges uh, where they are safe in the winter. If you think about a beaver, can't really escape very fast on land. And if the ice freezes, how are they gonna swim away, right? So what they do is they build these dams to bring the water level of ponds up high enough they can have all these underwater entrances. And then they take trees, um, and they put them down in the mud of the pond and then they can eat the cambrium, the inner bark, their food source by dragging it up into their lodges all winter long without having to come up on the ice. So a really great strategy. So beavers are perfectly happy in the winter uh, and certainly do not hibernate. So great question. Let's see here. Oh, it looks like Robin went out with Mike today. That's super fun. Robin, thanks so much for your feedback. We'll certainly let Mike know you tuned in. That was super fun. Ooh, Mark asks, what poisonous creatures exist in the Grand Tetons? Mark, that's a great question. Almost none. Almost none. It's a running joke around here that if it's going to kill you, it's going to be big enough and you'll certainly see it coming. Like, say, a bison, <laughs> right? Um, we do have... Um, northern rattlesnakes up in the very, very top of Yellowstone National Park up near Mammoth. Um, there's actually a really big rattlesnake in Mammoth that likes to hang out in the hot springs. He's super torpid because he, he eats the mice from the lodge and he's very fit and he's very fat and he sits in warm springs so the ground's warm. So he's a very happy old snake. 
Um, that's the only rattlesnake I've ever seen in Yellowstone. There's a couple others all the way up there. We don't have rattlesnakes in Grand Teton or in Southern Yellowstone. We don't have um, poisonous amphibians or reptiles down here either. We certainly have poisonous berries. So, you know, don't just eat any berry you can find. But generally speaking, um, not really any poisonous animals down here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem down in Grand Teton. So great question, I love that one. Let's see here. Lots of great answers for our store. Susan says, you got me on the bonus. Yes, Susan, that was my whole goal for the week. So thank you for the feedback, that's awesome. I finally got a hard enough question for Susan. Don, did I get a hard enough question for you? We'll have to see. Carrie says, I missed the question. My computer had a sound glitch. Carrie, uh, the question was, name me an animal that turns white in the winter. So if you missed it, that was the question. Let's see here. Julie says, will 399's quadruplets ever be tagged? Give it numbers. And if so, what is that process? Julie, if they survive to sub-adulthood, uh, which is to say they survive long enough to separate out from 399 and become adult bears, typically in their third year of life. Um, Grand Teton National Park and the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee makes the decision that any roadside bear cubs, cubs raised um, in front of people with a lot of human habituation, should wear a tag at least in the couple, first couple years, which is when they're most likely to get in trouble with people. Uh, just so that we can kind of keep an eye on them. So for instance, Grizzly Bear um, 399's last set of cubs were collared um, and got their tags last week, I think, as were Blondie's cubs. Um, so they will go out and they will sedate the bears um, and that sedation has a amnesiac effect. So they won't remember anything that happened after that. So they'll just suddenly get tired and sleepy after getting stung in the rear end by that dart. They'll fall asleep. At that point, they'll take lots of measurements. Um, there will be a veterinary expert on hand to make sure that they're doing well under their sedation. Um, and then they'll go ahead and give them that little piece of ear jewelry and then uh, a radio collar. Now that tag will automatically, the collar will automatically blow off when it runs low on batteries. And assuming that bear has lived a pretty clean, healthy life, has stayed out of garbage, stayed away from cattle, stayed away from bird feeders and the like, they may choose to not recollar that bear at that time. So the sub-adult phase of um, grizzlyhood between uh, the ages of three and four years old is when grizzlies uh, statistically in their lives are most likely to get into conflict with humans and get into human areas and um, maybe get into human food and become a problem for people. So if they can survive that period of time, they typically tend to have uh, pretty long lifespans after that. So yes, hopefully that answers your question. Let's see here. Oh, Maddie's got, Maddie's got me corrected. Maddie, you know better than me about sharks for sure. He says there's 16 shark attacks per year in the United States with one fatality every two years. So I said two fatalities a year. I'm probably just quoting an older study. Um, I haven't looked up fatalities from shark attacks in at least 15 years. So there's probably been a more recent piece of research that's been done that's more accurate. Uh, that is one fatality every two years. So thank you very much for that, Maddie. Same point, though, which is how many people visit a beach on the Pacific Atlantic coasts every year. To be afraid of sharks coming after you is a little bit silly. In the same way, to be afraid of grizzly bears coming after you in Yellowstone is probably a little bit silly. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be prepared. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be giving them their space. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be making noise in the woods and appropriately storing your food, right? There's something wrong with being intelligently conscientious, but you shouldn't be frightened, I guess is sort of where I was going with that. All right, let's see here. Don says, I was attacked by a fed squirrel once. Man, could it move? Don, I actually um, found that we had this terrible problem with chipmunks at Jenny Lake for a number of years. 
it's gotten a little bit better, but the Grand Canyon very famously had to actually euthanize a number of squirrels a couple of years ago because people were feeding squirrels on the South Rim and those squirrels were biting people and then people were getting really concerned about rabies and the like. Um, by the way, rabies from a squirrel is incredibly unusual, but of course rabies is very fatal, so better safe than sorry. The Park Service actually ended up having to euthanize those squirrels. So don't feeding it, no, don't feed the bears, yes, but don't feed the squirrels either. Just don't feed wildlife in general. So yeah, squirrels, squirrels are nothing to mess with. Let's see here. Toya says, should one wet layer when visiting Grand Teton? Toya, today's a great example of that. So I think when I woke up, it was like 35 degrees. And by the time we got to midday, it was breezy, but it was like 60. So yeah, lots of layers. I'm constantly shedding layers this time of year. It can be really lovely out um, or it can be quite chilly. Just depends. So great question. Is visiting Grand Teton and Yellowstone in October fun? Oh my gosh, so much fun. You just gotta be prepared for that weather. Um, it can be a bluebird sunny um, 60s or even 70s day, or it can be uh, 30s and snowing. And that's kind of the fun of it. You get all the views of snow, but you also get all the wonderful fall color and the breeding and running animals as well. So one of my favorite times of year. Let's see here. Paul Fontaine asks, last month with the Junction Wolf Pack chased off a grizzly that was getting near the pups. Was the bear identified as it did have a collar? Uh, I was on the day, I was on the hill with you that day. Not sure if it's come back. So that was with Sarah Ernst. And I did not hear from Sarah if they had identified which bear that was. That's not uncommon. Um, the Park Service doesn't just like make a press release and be like, this bear was the bear who was doing things. So unless that bear's got really identifying characteristics, um, sometimes we don't know. And one of the things you have to be really careful about is people get so excited about grizzlies and collar numbers and um, which bear is which because they have such amazing distinct personalities that sometimes they think every bear is a particular bear. So for instance, lately, because of all of the excitement about that big male who was on the elk who people suspected uh, was grizzly bear 791, everybody now thinks they're seeing 791 every single time they see a big male bear. Almost certainly not. There are plenty of big male bears in Yellowstone National Park. And so I do not know. I don't believe Sarah knows either. I will double check with her um, and I'll definitely respond to your comment if there is further information. But it's quite common for us to not necessarily know in those circumstances. Sarah says that she did get some amazing wolf footage earlier this week. She just got back from her multi-day and she's going to share us with that hopefully for next week's broadcast. So thanks very much for that question see here. I don't know if I see any more. I think we've gotten all the questions, guys. All right. It has been such a pleasure. I want to remind everybody that this broadcast is brought to us by the Travel and Tourism Board of Teton County, who wants to remind you to be clean, careful, and connected. Stay up to date with the latest COVID information at jhcovid.com. Remember to regularly wash your hands and face masks are required here in Teton County. So make sure you keep us all safe uh, here in Teton County and you do your part. We're all going to stay safe together, guys. It has been such a pleasure. I hope you all have enjoyed this week's broadcast and that you have a wild week and you stay safe. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>